Sweden and Finland say they want to join NATO. That's despite warnings from Moscow. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, are those countries under threat? And what will NATO membership mean for the Nordic region? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, NATO membership barely featured in political debate in Finland and Sweden. But Moscow's actions and nuclear threats may have gained the Western Military Alliance two new members. The leaders of both countries have the support of Germany, where they recently met Chancellor Olaf Scholz to talk about security in the region. Moscow has repeatedly warned of serious consequences if Finland or Sweden join the alliance, and the decision will be neither easy nor quick. If they apply, the parliaments of all 30 NATO countries need to approve new members and that could take time. If these two countries decide that they want to join NATO, they can count on our support. The members of the government made that clear here in the talks, and I think that is an important signal. In any case, both countries can always rely on Germany's support, regardless of NATO membership, and in the period before a decision is made on such membership. Well, the leaders of Finland and Sweden say the decision will come down to what their respective parliaments think is in their best security interests. As Russia wrongly claims the right to dictate the choices of others, NATO's open-door policy is even more important for us all. We have to decide on whether to apply for NATO membership or continue on our current path. That is the discussion we are having now in our national parliament. Whether Finland's decision will be joining NATO or not, it will be based on our will to contribute to our common security. My government is right now, together with all the political parties in the Swedish parliament, carrying out the supplementary security policy analysis, and this will be presented on May 13th. And the aim is that we will uh, have very good and thorough discussions and analysis within this group. The analysis include interna future international uh, defence partnerships for Sweden and including a discussion on NATO and all options are on the table. Now, before we get to our discussion, let's quickly remind you of what NATO actually is. It stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation. It's the world's biggest military alliance. It was founded in 1949, partly due to a perceived threat posed by the Soviet Union during the Cold War. But it's not stopped expanding since the fall of the bloc. It's grown from 17 countries in 1990 to 30 today. It pools weapons and resources from its member countries that include battleships, warplanes, missiles and more than 3 million personnel. If a NATO member is attacked, the others consider that an act of violence against them all. So let's bring in our guests for today. From Moscow, we're joined by Dmitry Babich, a political analyst at Inosmi, the internet media project based in Moscow. Uh, from Helsinki, Owen McNamara is visiting research fellow at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. And from Brussels, we're joined by international affairs strategist Nicholas White. Gentlemen, welcome to Inside Story. Dmitry, let's start with you. How will Russia react if the two countries join NATO? It's threatened to deploy nuclear weapons to the Baltic border region and uh, Kaliningrad. Should those threats be taken seriously? Uh, well, uh, so far, the statements were mostly made by the former Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, not by President Putin himself. So I wouldn't read too much into the statements from Medvedev. Obviously, Russia is very upset and distraught uh, about the possible membership of Finland and uh, Sweden in NATO. Let me remind you that during the Cold War, our relations with these two countries were not bad. Uh, with Finland, they were actually good. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, this membership won't bring much of a change because both uh, Sweden and Finland took part in dozens of military exercises in the last 10 years, all of them directed against Russia. In all of them, Russia was uh, basically almost officially named as the potential enemy. 
there are NATO troops uh, on the territory of uh, Finland, or maybe not uh, on a permanent basis, but uh, they visit uh, and they, they uh, always have a chance to, to move in very quickly. So, in fact, uh, strategically, this membership will not bring much of a change. So I think most of the protests from Moscow are like ritual protests. Like this was supposed to happen. I think President Putin took it into account when he took his decision uh, on Ukraine. Oh, and do you think that's right, that, that President Putin had taken this into account? I mean, how likely is it that Sweden and Finland will become NATO members in the near future? Is there any doubt that they soon will be? Uh, well, it looks more and more probable by the day right here now. I agree, uh, surprisingly, uh, with Dmitry in the sense that I don't think it will, it will make a very, very big difference because Finland and Sweden have been uh, very intensely uh, cooperating uh, with NATO uh, for the past decade or more. But I do crucially uh, disagree with Dmitry in the sense that these exercises and these drills uh, through which they have been cooperating through uh, have been directed against Russia. NATO and indeed the, the independent defence postures of, of Finland and Sweden uh, have been uh, defensive and, and defensive uh, against the Russia that has proven itself uh, ever more revanchist uh, over the past decade. Um, so that is how uh, things have been, how things are now that both the sense in Finland and in Sweden is that uh, although strong, their ind independent defense capacity is um, no longer um, enough of, a, of an insurance policy uh, considering uh, the very brutal aggression uh, that we are seeing uh, from Russia okay. in Ukraine at present. And they need an extra layer of deterrence um, and they need to be uh, never again alone. And NATO's uh, collective defense offers them uh, that option. Okay. So it is very, very likely uh, that both states will apply for NATO membership within uh, the next few weeks. And uh, the ratification process is, is very likely to begin at NATO's Madrid summit in June. OK. Dimitri, I'll give you a chance to come back on that in a moment, but let's bring in Nicholas White then in, in Brussels. Um, Nicholas, both countries are officially non-aligned militarily. Uh, they've both, as, as we've been hearing, become NATO partners, taking part in exercises and exchanging uh, intelligence. Uh, have both countries now permanently abandoned their previous stance of, uh, of strict neutrality? Yes. Well, if you talk to Finnish and Swedish politicians, they will they will object that they had abandoned this some time ago, that uh, they they were no no longer being equidistant as they had been in the Cold War, but that they were very definitely collaborating with NATO from an external perspective, and they simply want to convert this to an internal, to to being part of the team rather than cheering on from the sidelines. But this really goes to the heart of the whole current conflict, and this began because the the, the war began because. Because Russia was unhappy about Ukraine displaying self-determination and choosing its own path in terms of security, in terms of external alliances. Now we see that the lesson that Finland and Sweden are drawing is not that they should take Russian concerns into account, but that they should make these decisions autonomously for themselves. And I think it's very interesting that the, the major um, external uh, intention of the Russian war against Ukraine has backfired quite spectacularly. OK, uh, Dimitri, I don't know whether you want to come back on, on what you heard in, in, in those two answers there. Uh, let me put it to you that, that Russia's foreign minister, uh, ministry rather, the spokesperson for the foreign ministry, insisted that Sweden and Finland are being dragged into NATO by the US. Are they? Well, to a certain extent, uh, but uh, uh, I, I think this is something that Russians are very unwilling to admit, that Europe is changing and it is changing for the worse. There are actually no more neutral countries in Europe. You know, for many decades, the dream of Russian intellectuals was uh, to join Europe of neutral, peaceful countries. This Europe just doesn't exist anymore. I mean, Switzerland is no longer neutral. You know, it arrests bank accounts of foreign citizens. It joins sanctions against Russia, against other countries. Sweden is obviously also abandoning its neutral status. 
surprisingly, you know, the Central Asian countries, uh, when they have meetings of their uh, foreign ministries uh, in the collective security treaty organization uh, of which they are members, they say that they are not directed against any other country. When you have summit meetings of NATO, this is always about Russian threat or Chinese threat. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's easier to find now neutral countries, surprisingly, in the previously dictatorial Central Asia, no longer in Europe. Uh, as for the uh, reasons uh, why Russia uh, uh, basically uh, continued, uh, I think the war in Ukraine started in 2014, let's be frank about it. In fact, it started in 2013 when uh, uh, a violent coup against president, legally elected President Yanukovych was started with the support of foreign countries and dozens of policemen were killed. Uh, of course, it was not a peaceful process. So the war started in 2015. In 2022, uh, President Putin, to my mind, wrongfully decided to aggravate this war. Uh, but uh, I absolutely disagree with the view uh, that actually, you know, Russia was unhappy with Ukraine's independent stance. No. Uh, Russia was quite happy with Ukraine becoming independent in 1991. We had good relations until Maidan the terrible coup in uh, 2014, for 22 years, we had good relations. Uh, but uh, Russia was unhappy about Ukraine actually becoming hostile to Russia, you know. Uh, we are not against independent Ukraine, we are against hostile Ukraine. The same story with uh, NATO exercises in Sweden and Finland. My colleague in Finland said that these exercises are not directed against Russia, they are all defenses, they are all okay. defensive. Against whom is uh, Finland and uh, against whom is Sweden? Uh, against whom are they preparing to defend themselves? It is said openly against Russia. They're not going to defend themselves against, I don't know, Norway uh, or Denmark. Of course, against Russia. And this is sad because uh, this region should be a region of peace. Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, okay. with NATO membership, it will not be a region of peace, even formally. Yeah. It will be a region of military blocks. OK. Owen, do you want to come back on that, particularly Dmitry's um, assertion that the war in Ukraine began in 2014 with, with what he describes as a violent coup? Um, we can go back uh, longer than that. And we have, we have a phrase in English, uh, once bitten, twice shy, and we can go back to the war in... Um, in 2008 in Georgia and the efforts of the Obama administration after that. And we can go back into NATO enlargement in, in this effort to extend uh, liberal democratic peace and prosperity. NATO did something very unorthodox in the sense that it had the, it, it put in the pledge of no troops, uh, no nukes eastwards. So essentially to reassure Russia, to, to show Russia its hand in a way, um, it didn't have very strong provisions up against uh, Russia's borders, which, of course, uh, the Baltic states uh, and the Poles had been highlighting for many, many years. And, and, and NATO, to, to reassure Russia, uh, uh, stayed uh, persistent with this uh, right up against or uh, right up until uh, the illegal annexation of Crimea in, in 2014. And even then, the NATO Readiness Action Plan, um, Operation Atlantic Resolve, and later on, the Enhanced Forward Presence, uh, these deployments have been very, very light and scalable. And, and NATO has relied for its deterrence on, on mobilization, keeping most of its troops in the West, and only saying that it will call them up, call them into the region, uh, if the security situation uh, deteriorates further and uh, Russia displays even more aggression. Okay. Um, so this idea that that NATO is 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 the cause of this major buildup that that Russia uh, is fearful of um, is a red herring. Uh, that that is. Uh, featuring in the Russian narrative as they attempt to justify um, their revisionism and uh, their efforts uh, to reconsolidate and uh, 
their sphere of influence, okay. a for, uh, former glory uh, okay. in Central and Eastern Europe, something uh, that Finland and Sweden uh, do not want to be part of. And this is what is um, propelling uh, their um, effort uh, towards NATO right now. OK, two questions for Nicholas, uh, starting with what will Sweden and Finland bring to, to the alliance? Just how, how useful are they to European security? Oh, Sweden and Finland have got very impressive military uh, military uh, establishments, um, certainly on a par with any of the decent Western European countries. So from that point of view, they bring a very professionalised, well-experienced uh, force of, uh, of, of, of personnel. And of course, they also close the strategic gap around the Baltic Sea. Uh, the geographical dimension is very, very important here. Um, they basically turned the Baltic into a, into a NATO lake, which it previously was not. Okay. So it's very helpful for NATO for, to have them in. So what are the dangers then um, for the wider Baltic region, for Estonia, for Latvia, for Lithuania, um, the Baltic states south of Finland, of course, which also border Russia, bearing in, in mind that we've got the, the exclave of Kaliningrad sandwiched between Poland and, and, and Lithuania? All of these countries have been very concerned about the potential for aggression from Russia since their independence in 1990-1991. And all of them, with the exception of Sweden and Finland, had already made the determination that the best way to preserve that independence was to join NATO. As I said earlier, this conflict began because Russia did not accept that Ukraine was an independent state. It's absolutely clear if you look at what President Putin has said, what other Russian politicians have said. This is about whether countries have the right to choose their own future. Finland and Sweden have now decided that they will choose their own future and they're choosing their future within NATO. And Russia needs to accept that that is how the world works. Dmitry, Russia needs to accept that's how the world works. The country's deputy foreign minister said that Sweden and Finland joining NATO would seriously worsen the military situation in the region and lead to the most undesirable consequences. What was meant by that? Well, I think Nicholas was quite right when he called uh, the Baltics a NATO lake. Uh, whenever you have uh, a whole sea uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, controlled by just one military block, this is always bad. It's like Ottoman Empire controlled the Black Sea in the 17th, 18th century. The same story here. Uh, in fact, uh, the image of Sweden and Finland in Russia is still very good. We don't want to be enemies with that. And of course, there is a zero chance of a military solution like uh, the one that uh, Putin used against Ukraine, simply because Finland and Sweden behave much more rationally than the corrupt and brazenly nationalist Ukrainian regime that established itself by force in 2014. So I don't expect uh, anything like what happened in Ukraine. Okay. Uh, but I expect a lot of hostility and I expect a lot of paranoia. Not on our side. Let me remind you that every year in Sweden, there is a paranoia about these so-called Russian submarines. Uh, there was only one Soviet submarine that was once indeed caught in the, in the Swedish waters, and it got there by accident. Nick, but every year okay. we have it. All right. So this is just one example All right, how paranoid okay. these countries can be about uh, Russia, and that, this is unpleasant. Let me just throw that to Nicholas very briefly. Very, very, do you want to respond to that, Nicholas? I mean, Dimitri, you say so-called Russian submarines. If they're not Russian submarines, where are they from? Uh, and as you know, last time it was discovered that this was just a lie, uh, from uh, a person who claimed that he had seen a submarine, but there was no submarine. But almost every they year, there okay. are big nice. military operations catching Russian submarines, okay. and they never right. bring any results. Yeah. Several times we had it. Okay, I, I, I don't want to get bogged down into a, into a row about about submarines, particularly Owen. You're in in Helsinki. To to what extent is this NATO membership bid bid being driven? Uh, unusually by Finland here, that Sweden is is actually being swept along and into the alliance because of its eastern neighbours' desire to join. Well, I, I wouldn't say anyone is being swept along here. Uh, these states, NATO is a democratic alliance, and, and, and prospective members have to apply for membership. So all states will make their own um, 
sovereign decisions based on on their strategic calculations. Uh, but yes, uh, you're right. Uh, Finland is uh, the front runner, so to say, uh, among the two states. And things have have been seismic here throughout the spring. I mean, before February. 24th, where, where Russia launched its large-scale military assault, uh, its illegal assault on Ukraine. Um, before that date, only, only a number of weeks before that date, the Finnish Prime Minister, Sanna Marin, said um, that Finnish NATO membership was very unlikely to happen uh, during her tenure. That is what she said. But because of, of Russia's brutal aggression, uh, that is displayed uh, in Ukraine uh, over the past um, number of months. Uh, the Finnish public um, has now flipped. It used to be, uh, you know, in the last number of years, 60% against uh, NATO membership, 20% uh, for, the rest don't know. Now it's more than 60% for, 20% against and the rest don't know. So there's been a, a resounding reversal in, in favor of NATO membership, um, driven uh, by Russia's aggression, not driven by anything else, as Finland and the Finnish public uh, now believe uh, Russia is no longer taking calculated risks. It's, it's taking uh, major, major risks. Uh, as Barack Obama reflected on Putin's actions in Ukraine, Putin has bet the farm on this. Very, very aggressive. Um, and Finland needs the maximum okay. uh, deterrence option and the maximum uh, collective defense option so that it's never... It has, Finland has quite an impressive record fighting alone, but it still, that is not a desirable option. And Finland desires to be never again alone. And that is very much... Uh, a bottom-up okay. process that is occurring here in Finland right now. And that is what is propelling um, the bid right. for Finnish I, NATO membership forward. I'm sorry to, to, to cut you short, Owen, but time is, is against us here. A couple of more questions for, for Nicholas. What changes, Nicholas, would membership require both countries to make uh, in terms of, of foreign and security policy? It's a good question, and the answer is that, by and large, these changes have already been made. Uh, it will require Finland and Sweden to align their military policy, their procurement policy, uh, their general stance of engagement in the outside world with the North Atlantic Council, with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. But the fact is, as you mentioned in your introduction, that Finland and Sweden have already been largely participating in, the, in NATO exercises. So to a large extent, this integration has already happened. What we're looking at is the formalization of a relationship that until now has been provisional and, and transactional and shifting it to, towards something that is more fundamental and strategic. OK. And will, Nicholas, both countries act in unison regarding NATO membership, could you perhaps f foresee a, a, a situation where w one joins without the other? And, and how long yeah, well, will would... the ratification process take? I mean, Norway's Prime Minister is on record as saying, oh, it's, it's going to take a matter of weeks, two weeks, he said, uh, she said. Um, yeah. uh, is that realistic? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I would not like to tell any Finn that their destiny is linked to Sweden, let alone vice versa. Uh, the two processes will proceed independently, but in parallel. It would be the least surprising outcome if the two of them end up joining at the same time, but other outcomes are, of course, possible. Right. The ratification process, first of all, everybody really is in favour of this, so it won't take all that long. Having said that, in some countries there are formalities that simply take a while to get through. The President of Croatia has mentioned that he wants to make it the process conditional on a completely different issue, the reform of the election law in Bosnia. I don't think that's a sustainable position, but it will have to be overcome. I would have thought it's likely to take less than a year. I can't really see why it would drag on for much longer than that, even in the most convoluted of parliamentary systems. OK, gentlemen, there we must leave it. Uh, thank you uh, to all of you for being on the programme today. Dmitry Vavich in Moscow, uh, Owen McNamara in Helsinki, and, of course, in Brussels, Nicholas White. Uh, as always, thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme again at any time, but just by going to the website at altazero.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page. You can find that 
at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. I'll see you again. Bye now.